Hello, welcome to Stanley Road Baptist Church. My name is Mark. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, if you weren't already aware of that, what you are already probably aware of is that it is Pentecost Sunday. Now, traditionally, that's the day that we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. It's after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. He's appeared to his disciples in his resurrected form, and he's been around for about 40 days. And then he ascends into heaven, and it's, he's leaving them. But he has promised something special is coming. He has promised the giving of the Holy Spirit. And this is what it's described like. They were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So just extraordinary event that just blew them away. And as they're, they're going outside, they're speaking in all these different tongues. There are people who are visiting from all over Jerusalem uh, who speak their own languages, and they're hearing the disciples speak their languages, even though they're Galileans. And they think, well, these guys aren't linguists. What's going on with them? In fact, they think they might be drunk. But they're not drunk. And it's Peter the Apostle who stands up to preach. And uh, he starts off his preaching with this quote from Joel, the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, it's always an extraordinary account reading of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And uh, in our sermon today, we are going to be speaking about the Holy Spirit um, and, and about how he's active in our lives today. Because that last statement that Peter says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Well, that still absolutely applies. And we have called on the name of the Lord and by the Holy Spirit, we have been saved but what we do miss and what we do long for is these mighty outpourings and power of the Holy Spirit. Because Peter preached this sermon and 3,000 people believed in Jesus and joined the church. Now, whenever we hear that, we always imagine what would happen in Morecambe if 3,000 people believed in Jesus and started attending all the churches in the town. That would transform our place and may even transform our country. Now, there are people who already believe that um, the, the, the United Kingdom is starting to see a greater thirst for God and a revival is slowly starting. But on the day of Pentecost, if no other, we should be praying for the Holy Spirit uh, to come through like a wind and sweep us off our feet so that we can then preach and speak that word and sweep off their feet of all of the people that we know and love and all of the people in our community who are essentially living in darkness without knowing about uh, their Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, and our God who loves them and is reaching out to them to fellowship with them. So in a moment, we're going to um, have a song from Emu Music, O Breath of God, Come Breathe Within Us. And it talks about needing that renewing and reviving spirit 
of God to come through and move in mighty works of power. But before we do that, uh, will you pray with me as we pray for this day of Pentecost, uh, that we will remember the power of the Holy Spirit and we will seek, uh, seek that power in our own lives, but also ask God to move in mighty ways that we can't even control to bring about his uh, will on earth as it is in heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are always humbled when we read of the work of your Holy Spirit um, throughout uh, the Scripture, throughout the Acts of the Apostles and all through the Old Testament and even the reports that we hear in the letters of the Apostles uh, in the rest of the New Testament. We're also humbled, Lord, when, when we hear accounts of your Holy Spirit working and moving in the lives of people uh, in our country and around the world, Lord. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would work in mighty works of power that we can't explain or describe or even expect it. Sweep us off our feet and fill us with love for you, love for your Son, and a desire to go out and seek the lost. Lord, Heavenly Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would descend uh, on our time and that, Father, men and women who don't know you as their Saviour, Lord, and are living in darkness um, of, of all types and sorts, that, Lord, the light of your Son, Jesus Christ, would shine in their lives. So we ask, Lord, show your power in us today. Amen.
sweeping through us. Revive your church with life and power. Uh, many of you took part in the prayer day that we uh, had during Holy Week as part of our uh, church uh, worship during that week. And uh, some of you uh, even took part in the prayer walk that happened that day where we walked around the neighborhood of the church, just around the streets and the homes that are present here and prayed for them. And like during that prayer walk, it's, you become conscious very quickly of just how many people are living in the local vicinity of our church and the, the many needs that they have, um, anxieties, sorrows, uh, cares, joys uh, and hopes uh, that are represented there and how much uh, need there is really to do those prayer walks and to pray but to pray mostly that Jesus Christ will be known and to be seen by the people in our neighbourhood. Now when you kind of stretch out and start to look at where uh, people are living in the whole of Morecambe and Hesham it can be a little bit overwhelming. So I'm just going to cycle through some images now of our whole town and some of these regions. Uh, these are aerial images uh, from Google Maps. So first is Taurus Home and Westgate. Bear. what I've called town, Hesham, the West End, and of course, uh, the local neighborhood of the church. I think you can see how many families are living here. And that's not even the whole of Morecambe. Some of you who are local may even be outside the boundaries of some of those places. So I want to uh, focus your prayers that the Holy Spirit will be poured out on our town, uh, that people will see who Jesus Christ is, um, but also just as uh, we'll reach as many people as possible for the gospel uh, in this area, through all the churches that are working uh, to do that in Morecambe. Second thing I want to focus your prayers on is a tragedy which happened um, in our area last Sunday. I'm sure many of you are aware of the explosion that happened in a home in Hesham, uh, which has claimed the life of a two-year-old boy, George Hines, who's been killed and a man and woman who are still critically ill in hospital um, as a result of that explosion. So I think it's worth praying for George's family, and we do have the names of his mother, Vicky Studholm, and father, Stephen Hines, and I think because their names are in the papers, we can pray for them by name. Um, also, through investigation, the authorities have uh, decided that there are six homes there that will need to be totally demolished and uh, and rebuilt. So that's six um, residences, perhaps even six families who are having to go through a huge disruption now. So uh, there are plenty of things to praise for as the town has responded uh, to this. Uh, that GoFundMe page, which I, I think when I uh, last looked was up to £47,000, which is just extraordinary. Uh, and donations that have been given to help people who had to evacuate their homes quickly. Uh, but we do need to keep praying because as, this tra as they come to terms of this tragedy, it's, um, it is going to be so disruptive for their lives and they'll be carrying sorrow. So be still and pray and a slide will come up with some of those uh, things on it uh, to pray for now.
If you've been using these YouTube services for worship during the last six weeks, or if you've actually been worshiping in the building itself uh, during the last six weeks, you will know that we're focusing in on the prayer that we pray at the end of each one of those services. It's a prayer which helps to unite us together as a community of Christ. It's a prayer that helps us to take everything that we've experienced during that time of worship, to dedicate it to God and, for, and to ask him to help it to work on our lives. And it's a prayer where we're seeking that power of the Holy Spirit to go out into the world with the love of Christ and to show it uh, to those that we meet. Now that is actually a daunting proposition. During our prayer course that we've been doing as part of our Zoom house groups uh, this week, the chap who's teaching on it, the, the videos, Pete Gregg, showed a picture, uh, an icon, that I think was painted in the third century, and it's of Jesus and an abbot, Abbot Mena. And people who study this sort of thing have noticed that the abbot has got toes peeking out from underneath the garment that he's wearing, and Jesus doesn't appear to have any feet at all. And that's been interpreted to mean that Jesus doesn't have feet to go walking out into the world and because he has ascended to be at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And in actual fact, Jesus' feet in this world to go walking to bring the good news are disciples like the Abbot Mena and actually disciples like you and me. We're called to be Jesus Christ in the world, to bring the message of the good news of the gospel, uh, to speak about salvation and to bring light and life uh, into, into the world around us, which can often be in such darkness. Now, the problem with that is that we aren't Jesus. And long gone are the days when uh, everyone in the country pretty much knew the gospel, knew who Jesus was, and if you could just get them into a church building or get them into an auditorium, and particularly if you had a particularly powerful speaker like Billy Graham uh, to come and speak, um, and he could just help get them over the line to believing in Jesus, you're going to find, as time, particularly as time has gone on, that the people that you know do not know who Jesus is, do not know the gospel. And actually the only way that they're going to get even a glimpse of what it means to be a follower of Jesus is them being with you and understanding what you understand of Christ's love for you and you showing it to them. Now that is scary when we put it like that and when we look into ourselves and we see that we're not gentle like Jesus. We see uh, that we're not selfless and self-sacrificing like Christ is. And we see that we don't have the same levels of compassion, never mind the power to do great miracles, to rise people from the dead and to make the blind see. Quite often, we feel powerless. So how is the Holy Spirit expected to be at work in our daily lives as we go about our business seeking to be Christ in the world? The passage that we've chosen this week to understand how we can know the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives is one where all isn't well. It's from a letter that Paul the Apostle, one of the early church leaders, uh, wrote to a young church in Galatia, the Galatian church, that have really gone the wrong way. And they have stopped being able to really show God's love to others because of what's happening with them. After Paul the Apostle left, there were some people who came in who were teaching that following Jesus and being a disciple of Jesus wasn't enough. That if you wanted to be a follower of Jesus and you weren't a Jew, well, you had to become a Jew as well. You had to follow the Jewish nation's laws and customs as given in the Old Testament. 
Now, for the men in particular, that was bad news because it involved being circumcised. But they actually wanted all of the law and the customs to be followed. And what that meant was that it meant that Jesus didn't really need to be crucified if we're just going to follow the old laws. And there would be no new covenant, new way of being the image of God in the world, as Jesus said there would be. So Paul has to write into this situation. Now, some people in the Galatian church have believed that what these false teachers have taught. And what has that led to? It has led to fighting within the church. In fact, it actually says they're biting and devouring each other. I'm sure that's not literal. It's a metaphor to say that we're fighting so much we're almost going to destroy each other. How is that the image of Christ? So Paul wants the power of the Holy Spirit to work in their lives so that they can show the love of Christ to each other and to the world outside. This is what he writes. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. Idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy. Drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. The first part of this passage, I think, helps us to understand the human condition a little bit better. The Christians in the church in Galatia knew that all of God's law was based on one simple law, love your neighbor as yourself. But uh, rather than being able to serve one another in love and in humility, they are biting and devouring each other. As human beings, we're made in the image of God, but it's an image that has become distorted because we want to go our own way, because we don't want to do what God says, because it has been twisted by sin. And we can take the very best things and distort and turn them into things that can do real evil and can destroy us. Now, history is full of examples of where this has happened. But I think a really uh, clear recent one in our modern times has been the use of uh, the internet and social media in particular. Uh, Those of us who are a bit older can remember the beginning of sites like Facebook and certainly can remember Twitter and uh, the excitement of being able to be connected with so many people and to be able to share um, thoughts and feelings and so many good things are coming uh, come out of it. If you want to raise money for charity, you put your appeal up on Facebook and you can get a GoFundMe page now and so much good can be done. You want to share a thought, it can be blasted around the world uh, in a minute and uh, all of the wonderful kind 
and beautiful things that happen on social media sites can bring us great joy. But actually, nowadays, if you talk about Facebook or Twitter, it's usually in a negative way because human nature, that distorted image of God is capable of wonderful things, but also capable of the very worst things. It's become a place where children have been abused, where uh, people have been radicalized and recruited for terrorist groups, uh, where lots of misinformation about vaccines and COVID-19 and conspiracy theories um, are springing up and people are finding themselves just locked into those echo chambers and uh, good people are being led to do evil acts because of this influence. That's kind of what it means to be a human, a distorted image of God, which Paul in this passage calls the flesh. And he has a solution for it for these Galatian Christians. I say, live by the Spirit and you won't gratify the desires of the flesh, that desire to, to get over one over on someone else, to go after negative things, to go after those things which make you feel good but don't do you any good and can, and can devour and destroy other people. He says, if you are led by the Spirit, you won't gratify the flesh. We believe that as followers of Jesus, we have the gift of the Holy Spirit. But it's not like a magic wand, zap, you've got the Holy Spirit, now everything is perfect. That's not what Paul is telling us here. He is making it clear that we're still carrying that human nature around with us. And when we fall out of step with the Holy Spirit, when we're not being led by the Holy Spirit, the flesh the human nature starts to have its influence in our lives again. And in the flesh and the, and, the, and the Holy Spirit are fighting against each other until we can't even do what we want to do. We're so conflicted inside between the influence of God and the influence of our own desires, which are trying to lead us away in evil directions. So we shouldn't be surprised when we can look into our own lives and see where we have given in to those passions and desires which we know bring about destruction in our own lives and destruction in others. We also shouldn't be surprised when we see it happening in the church because we still bring that human nature with us and they're human beings who are Christians just as well as our human beings in the world. So we shouldn't be shocked by it, but we should always be saddened by it. But at the same time, we should never feel powerless that we can't live a life that is in step with God because we have the Holy Spirit and we can be light and salt in this world and we can fulfill what it really means to be a human being showing the image of God. Now, Paul draws our attention to what it looks like when we're being led by our human nature, by that fleshly part of us rather than the Holy Spirit, he draws our attention to acts of the flesh, which he says are obvious. And it's quite a long list, starting with sexual uh, types of acts of the flesh, and then idolatry and witchcraft. So uh, going, uh, putting other things in the place of God or seeking after evil spirits for power. And then he goes into things which are a little bit less obvious, like hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy. And then he finishes with more obvious fleshly acts, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Now he does say, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So it's one very important thing to say, that when he says that, he's talking about... Um, when there's a pattern of life like this, where this is the pattern of someone's life. It's just full of this list of acts of the flesh. And that's important for us to hear, because particularly in the middle of that list, there are things which we could apply to all of us. Now, I think that's why he's giving us a list of the acts of the flesh. Because as believers in this world, as we seek to walk by the Spirit, there are times when we lash out in hatred towards someone 
and we need to know that's an act of the flesh. I need to stop and repent and get back in step with the Spirit. Or we look too long at uh, a member of the opposite sex, someone we're sexually attracted to, and start to fantasize. That's when we need to stop, repent, and get back in step with the Spirit. Or we're inclined to split off into factions and gather people around us who are like-minded and talk about them over there and how they're bad for all sorts of reasons. Then we need to stop, repent, and get back into step with the Spirit. Or we find ourselves, rather than seeking to serve sacrificially in God's world, we're finding ourselves ambitiously trying to get to the top and climb over, over other people. We're full of selfish ambition. We need to stop, repent, and get back in step with the Spirit. Now, Paul doesn't leave us with that negative list. Um, he gives us another list. This one isn't the acts of the flesh. It is the fruit of the Spirit. And if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you'll be familiar with it. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, as well as watching out for those acts of the flesh and stopping repenting and getting back in step with the Spirit, we also need to recognize when we are in step with the Spirit and we are seeing that bear fruit in our lives. When we show love to someone that we wouldn't naturally show love to. When we feel an unaccountable, unaccountable joy of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Uh, when we feel when we feel peace in the midst of turmoil or when we are motivated to bring about peace in the workplace or the family or amongst friends, when we're patient and we wouldn't normally be patient, when we're kind, good and faithful, gentle and self-controlled. Now this is the Christian's superpower. And it's worth noting that this is a list that they all go together, okay? No one has ever said, oh, isn't, isn't this person lovely? They're full of love, joy, peace, forbearance, but they're not very kind. Um, and their self-control is just terrible. No, they all come together, don't they? As we're gradually formed uh, into the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. And it is our superpower. Because we are the person that... Everyone knows will help in times of trouble. We are the person, if we're walking in the Spirit, who can help to bring about peace between people who are in conflict with each other. Uh, we are the people who can show patience in a situation where everyone else has run out of patience. When our work colleague or friend or family member it's really hard times in life and they need someone to talk to who will show self-control and not gossip with others about it, who will show gentleness and faithfulness and following through and helping out with that trouble. They're going to call on the Christian who's got that superpower, the Holy Spirit working in their life because they've seen that you don't fly into fits of rage at the, the least disturbance. And even though someone in work or in the family has acted against you, you haven't hated them and you have sought forgiveness. And when someone else has insulted you, you have, you have uh, sought to be reconciled with them. The fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives marks us out as people who are different. And it allows us to show love to those who may have seen no love or very little love in their lives. So how do we know the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives? By the fruit of the Spirit being shown. So the only, the last thing now is to think, well, how do we do this? How do we walk in the Spirit? How do we live by the Spirit? How do we keep in step with the Spirit? Well, first of all, we recognize when we're out of step, we repent and we get back in step. 
we recognize when we are showing fruits of the Spirit in our lives and we celebrate those and thank God for them and we look at them in other people's lives and we celebrate that in, in other Christians' lives that we see. But there's a, another step here that Paul has here. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. In order to keep in step with the Spirit, we're going to find that there are certain things in our lives that we have to crucify, that we have to put death to. Like that sexual immorality, that sexual thing that you get pleasure from that uh, doesn't glorify God. Or those secret hatreds that you hold on to. Those f- people you won't forgive because what they've done to you is so much worse than what anyone else has ha- ever had done to them. And so you won't forgive them. That selfish ambition which keeps you wanting to climb to the top, you might have to let that go. And that involves letting go of pride and all sorts of things. So keeping in step with the Spirit means walking in the faith in, G- faith in Jesus Christ. It does mean crucifying parts of ourselves which uh, can be hard to let go by. But we live by the Spirit. Let us keep in step with the Spirit. And let us know that power of the Holy Spirit in our lives as we seek to show others the love of the Lord Jesus Christ.
Thank you for joining us for this YouTube service. We hope and pray that this has been a time of worship for you, that you have heard God's voice, that uh, you have known his touch and you have felt his presence as uh, you have been going through <coughs> this act of worship. Also hope and pray that you have uh, felt a challenge, but also a comfort as, uh, as we've sought to teach you today from God's word. Now, you may already be realizing that there's fruit of the Spirit in your life and wanting to celebrate that and thank God that he is working uh, in your life. Or you may actually f be worried about those acts of the flesh that have been, have been too prominent and feel that you need to stop, repent, and get back in step with the Spirit. Either way, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, normal church contact details uh, will be appearing on the screen now. And uh, you may even feel that you'd benefit from someone to listen to you and pray with you. Um, just seeking that little bit of extra fellowship and spiritual help. And uh, we, can, we can help and facilitate that to happen. Do pray for me this week. I'm sure many of you are aware that this is la Stephen's last week before he begins his sabbatical, which means after this week I'll be taking over um, as, uh, as, in, as, as a pastor of the church just for those three months while he's away. Um, so do pray for me. Pray that I will walk by the Spirit, that I will crucify the flesh um, and those acts of the flesh, and that I will be able to lead the church uh, in a way that is faithful to God and faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ as I walk in step with the Spirit. So I'm looking forward to that adventure with you and for what the, the coming few months might bring. Let's uh, close our service uh, out together as we pray the prayer that we do every Sunday that we're focusing on with extra emphasis on knowing the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Let's pray. Father God, as we go from here, we pray we will grow in our understanding of your love for us in Christ. And may we know the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives as we show your love to others, for your glory, forever and ever. Amen. Shelter.